Hello! It seems that Homo erectus used rafts or boats to cross straits between land masses. This was more than a million years ago. The first representation of a ship was found on a small painted pottery disc. There, one can admire a refiguration of what seems to be a boat with two masts. It was discovered in Kuwait and dates to the late 5th millennium BC. Taking to the sea is not an easy task even nowadays, let alone in the ancient times or even as recently as one or two hundred years ago. However, danger does not always come from the whims of Mother Nature, pirates or wars. Diseases have claimed countless lives of sailors and travelers over the centuries. One of them was particularly ferocious and insidious, scurvy. The decimation of sailors by scurvy, how lemons saved them from it, and how medicine was radically changed in the process. Next on Random History. Vitamins are micronutrients, which an organism needs in small quantities but are essential for its proper functioning and metabolism. Vitamin C is involved in tissue repair and the proper functioning of the neural and immune systems. It is also an antioxidant. Most animals can synthesize their own vitamin C. Humans, however, are unable to do so. Consequently, for us to cover our needs in vitamin C, we have to obtain it from dietary sources. Vitamin C is found in plant foods such as oranges, lemons, lime, strawberries, various species of peppers, broccoli and cabbage. It should be noted that vitamin C is very sensitive to heat. Furthermore, its concentration in foods decreases with time proportionally to the temperature at which they are stored. So, the various fruits and vegetables must be consumed raw and as fresh as possible. Animal sourced foods do not provide much vitamin C and what little there is is largely destroyed by the heat of cooking. Vitamin C was discovered in 1912 and isolated in 1928. It was the first vitamin to be synthesized in laboratory in 1933 and nowadays one can readily procure inexpensive over-the-counter dietary supplements containing vitamin C. Scurvy is a disease caused by the insufficient intake of vitamin C. Initial manifestations of scurvy include weakness, malaise, fatigue and soreness of the joints. If untreated, other symptoms start to appear such as redness of the gums which start to bleed spontaneously, bruising of the skin which is also prone to bleeding and hair and tooth loss. As scurvy worsens, wood healing becomes poor and old wounds might even reopen. Victims at the last stages of the disease decline steadily into lethargy and death, which is usually due to severe infection or bleeding. It takes at least a month of little or no vitamin C in the diet before symptoms start to manifest. Today's scurvy affects more commonly people with mental disorders, unusual eating habits, alcoholics or neglected seniors. Scurvy cases are not rare in the developing world where malnutrition is sort of endemic and among refugees. Treatment is relatively straightforward. It is based on the administration of vitamin C supplements, usually taken by mouth. Regression of symptoms is noted within a few days and full recovery is achieved in about two weeks. The typical diet of a sailor, at least at in the beginning of the 20th century, was lacking in fresh fruit and vegetables, the main sources of vitamin C. Thus, scurvy decimated seamen that ventured out in the oceans for long voyages. Between the time of Columbus's transatlantic voyage and the advent and rise of steam agents in mid-18th century, scurvy has claimed the life of more than 2 million sailors. The problem was extremely common. Ship owners and governments assumed a 50% death rate from scurvy among sailors on any major voyage. Scurvy was responsible for more deaths at sea than storms, shipwrecks, combat and all other diseases combined. 
In fact, scurvy was so devastating that the search for a treatment became imperative. Historians described the cure as a vital factor determining the destiny of nations. We are in 1739. The world's mightiest naval superpowers, the United Kingdom and Spain, are about to engage in war over the control of the Caribbean. The Britons are determined to disrupt Spanish commerce between Mexico and Manila. This is a mission for George Anson, who at the time held the rank of Commodore in the Royal Navy. Anson is given six warships and two additional merchant vessels that would carry additional provisions. He has 1,854 men under his command. The task is Herculean in every sense of the word. He has to leave Portsmouth, England in the summer of 1740 and reach the Pacific coast of South and Central America. There, he has to fight the Spanish ships, attack coastal towns if possible and return to England via the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Remember that we are in the 18th century and there is no Panama or Suez Canal to speak of. These are wooden sailing ships. The flotilla has to circumvent Cape Horn and the Cape of Good Hope where the sea is treacherous on a good day. And they actually did it. This voyage certainly merits more than a mere reference. However, to make a very long story short, the stubborn British did attack coastal Spanish towns. They also did disrupt Spanish commerce between the Americas and the Philippines. But their most admirable achievement was the capture of the treasures transported by Spanish ships. Anson and his crew made it back to Portsmouth a mere four years later. But from the original 1,800 men, only 188 men survived. Most of them had succumbed to scurvy. It was a pyrrhic victory. In comes a Scottish physician named James Lind. Lind read the account of Aston's voyage and was, not surprisingly, horrified. He thus set out to find a cure for scurvy. In 1747, the good doctor was serving as a naval surgeon on the British ship HMS Salisbury. He devised a way to test the efficacy of various at the time proposed cures for scurvy. Lind was an advocate of the theory which stipulated that scurvy was due to putrefaction of the body. It was assumed that acids would counter the putrefaction. Thus, he included a dietary supplement of an acidic quality in the experiment. Two months into the voyage, the crew, as one would expect, started to manifest symptoms of scurvy. Lind selected 12 of the afflicted sailors and divided them into six groups of two. All of them received the same diet, but each group received a different supplement. Group 1 was given a quart of cider, group 2 25 drops of elixir of sulfuric acid, group 3 6 spoonsfuls of vinegar, group 4 half a pint of seawater, group 5 2 oranges and 1 lemon, and the last group received a spicy paste plus a drink of barley water. Except for the oranges and lemons which ran out in less than a week, Lind administered the treatment for 14 days. It didn't take long for one treatment to emerge as better than the others. The men treated with lemons and oranges had a swift and thorough recovery. They even helped Lind care for the rest of the sailors. So, problem solved. Scurvy was not a threat to sailors anymore. All ships were supplied with oranges and lemons. Unfortunately, things did not turn out exactly this way. Even Lind himself failed to appreciate the importance of the results of his study. When he retired from the Navy in 1748, he started to work on the first edition of a massive book on scurvy. The book was more than 400 pages long and was dedicated to Anson. Alas, the crucial experiment was described in a mere five paragraphs, coming about 200 pages into the book. Of course, Lind 
was not trying to bury the lead, he just misinterpreted his findings. Sure, sailors receiving lemons and oranges recovered fully, but sailors having the cider did seem to get better as well. This is plausible since the cider, distributed by Lind, might have contained small amounts of vitamin C. Only in 1795, a physician by the name of Gilbert Blaine, another Scotsman, convinced the Royal Navy to issue some form of lemon juice to its sailors. It was a year after Lindt had passed away. This order may have well changed the course of history. In 1905, Britain was at war with Napoleon's France. A naval blockade was imposed by the Royal Navy on France to fend off a possible Napoleon-led invasion of the British Isles. This blockade lasted until 1814. Ships had to spend months at sea, not coming to port. This would have been impossible if scurvy had had its way. No wonder a lemon tree now adorns the official crest of the Institute of Naval Medicine of the Royal Navy. Descriptions of the symptoms of scurvy were recorded by the ancient Egyptians in the 2nd millennia BC and by Hippocrates who lived from 460 to 370 BC. Over the centuries, many of the explorers we learn about at school have been affected by scurvy. Vasco da Gama, the first European to circumnavigate the Cape of Good Hope and reach India by sea, lost his brother to it. Ferdinand Magellan achieved the first European navigation from the Atlantic to Asia through the strait in South America that now bears his name. He saw many of his men succumb to scurvy. It comes as very odd that the therapeutic effects of lemons and oranges have actually been identified by many. This knowledge, however, has been repeatedly forgotten and rediscovered until vitamin C was isolated in the beginning of the 20th century. Even after the Royal Navy started to issue lemon juice to sailors, problems persisted. Sometimes lemon juice was heated to be preserved and the vitamin C in it was destroyed. Furthermore, when lemon juice is stored for a long period, its vitamins break down. At one point, the Royal Navy opted for limes instead of lemons because they were cheaper and more readily available. This led to British sailors being referred to as limeys. Unfortunately, limes contain only half as much vitamin C as lemons do. The story of finding the therapy for scurvy goes to show why medical advancement is so agonizingly slow. Progress is a painstaking procedure. The solution is often at a hand's reach, but not easily identifiable. Frustration is ever present. Thankfully, scurvy, oranges and lemons, and of course James Lind, have contributed to making this process a lot easier and a lot speedier. Clinical trials are experiments or observations done to determine the safety and effectiveness of medications, devices, diagnostic products and treatment arrangements intended for human use. The importance of clinical trials in the struggle for developing new effective solutions to medical problems cannot be overemphasized. The study Lind conducted in 1747 on HMS Salisbury trying to find the best cure for scurvy is the first properly documented clinical Trial. The design of the study was novel and revolutionary. Two aspects of this design have earned the study the title of the first clinical trial. First, it had a comparative nature. Different dietary regimens were compared for their effectiveness. Second, Lindt attempted to control for other variables. In order to check the efficacy of each dietary supplement, he made sure that other variables were common for all 12 sailors. Namely, all sailors followed the same dietary regimen except for the supplement and all sailors lived in the same environment, the ship that is. This type of design rendered the study's findings more reliable. Thus, it is an important milestone in the history of clinical trials and of medical research as a whole. And this was the story of how lemons changed medicine. Did we miss anything? We would love to hear what you have to say in the comments below. If you feel so inclined, please like, share and subscribe in order not to miss out on our future videos. And if you have any suggestions for subjects you would like us to dwell into, 
note them in the comments below. Until the next time, keep learning!